Good afternoon. This is S.J. Thomason at Christian Apologist, and I'm here today by uh, five lovely women, and we're going to also be joined by a gentleman named Dell. And I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to Heather to introduce everyone. Great. Uh, let me push mute. Uh, welcome. Good afternoon, everyone uh, who is listening. Uh, welcome to the live coffee talk with uh, Christians who will be giving a salvation testimony. I look forward to hearing uh, from some Christians today from, uh, let's see, from Jan and Julie, Rachel, Anne, uh, Stephanie, and myself. Uh, hopefully we'll get uh, to hear from Dell. I think he's trying to log in. Um, so we will be talking today about a time when we accepted Christ as our Lord and Savior. And <clears throat> we will be talking about the wonderful things that the Lord has really done uh, for us. We are very blessed to have Stephanie uh, welcome us on her YouTube channel called Christian Apologist. Uh, Stephanie Thomason is a Christian apologist, and she provides live coffee talks that can be really life-changing. I have enjoyed listening to so many of those, <laughs> um, and I hope you will um, enjoy them as well. Uh, these di meaningful discussions are really for all people. They're for atheists, and they're for people of all religions. Um, so uh, here we go. Uh, my name is Heather Schult, and um, you know, recently I've been using my gifts and skills to encourage Christians to talk about you know, that time in their life when they made the most important decision ever to place their faith and trust in the one who paid the penalty for our sins, um, and he is the one who was raised from the dead. So it is my great honor to introduce uh, these wonderful people who know what it means to abide in Christ. Uh, they know what it means to proclaim the wonderful things the Lord has done. First, we have um, Jan Martin. She is an award-winning Christian children's author, speaker, teacher, and blogger. Uh, we have Julie Dibble. She is uh, also a speaker uh, and an author. Uh, we have Rachel Schmoyer, uh, who is also a speaker. She's a writer, a pastor's wife, and she's the teacher of how to read the hard parts of Scripture, uh, which sounds very interesting. Uh, we also have Ann Kincaid. She is a beautiful praise harpist, uh, and hopefully we'll get to hear from Dell uh, if he can log in. <laughs> so <clears throat> he is a Christian apologist. Uh, so here we go. Each testimony will be about five to ten minutes long. So here we go. Thank you, Heather. Sure. Thank you. I'm Jan, and my faith walk started when I was very little. Um, growing up, there was no question. We went to church and Sunday school, and most of my friends came from the church, um, in third grade, my Sunday school teacher assigned a verse to me. It was Proverbs 22, 6, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. This verse has resonated with me throughout my entire life. Um, I strayed once in a while, not remembering to ask God to help me, but when I would remember my verse, he would pull me back in. Um, sometimes my humanness gets in my way and I don't always do things the way I should. Um, there was a time where I felt he wanted me to talk to a woman at a Target store. Um, we then met later for coffee and I was able to help her connect and get a better job and be able to get insurance for her ill son who really needed some help. Um, it, it taught me to listen when God's telling me to stop and talk to someone. And it's kind of fun, too, to see how the reactions go. Uh, many years ago, I was facing surgery. I was having abdominal pain, and we didn't know what the problem was. And I was extremely scared. Uh, my mother had passed away when she was 46 years old. She started with breast cancer and it spread throughout her body. And at the time, 
we had a two-year-old daughter and I was so scared that I had cancer and that I wasn't going to be there to raise my daughter. Um, I talked to pastor and his reaction was, don't be silly. Just because your mother had cancer doesn't mean you're going to have cancer, which devastated me. And I told him when my surgery was, and I called the church the day before my surgery and wanted to see if he would visit with me and go be at the hospital for me. The answer I got when I called the church was he had left on vacation. So I had no one to turn to. So that night I laid on my bed crying, asking for God's help. I said, I can't do this by myself. I need you. I literally felt a heavy weight being lifted from me. When I went to the hospital the next day, I was joking around with everybody and it just totally relaxed. It was like the most wonderful feeling after being so scared to know that God had me in the palm of his hand. Uh, going in, I knew that I would either have a Band-Aid or a major Band-Aid, <clears throat> depending on what, what they found. I was blessed. It was endometriosis. <clears throat> Excuse me. And it was just an easy fix with medicine. And the, it took, by having the surgery and the medications, I was able to get rid of all my pain. Um, so that really turned my faith around and to know that you have to lean on God. You have to always trust that he knows what's best, whether it's an answer you want or not, if he knows what is better for you. And that is when we also learned that we needed to tithe. I, our money was at its tightest. My husband was out of work. Um, we just had a very small pension from the Navy. And I just, I told him, I says, I feel like the Spirit's telling me we need to start tithing. And he's, okay, I'm not arguing with the Spirit. And we did. I wrote my check to church first. And through the grace of God, we always had enough to make, to meet all our bills throughout the month. It was, it, it was a struggle, but it, it, I wasn't afraid of it. I knew we were still going to be okay. And then several years later, God was talking to me again and told me I was to go back to school and try for, um, and become an associate in ministry, which is a commissioned um, position in the Lutheran church. And they've since called, changed our name to deacons. Um, it was an exciting experience to actually learn more theological background in the church and how to use different things to uh, work with the people. At my second call, um, pastor asked me if I would do the uh, service on Christmas Eve for the families and that I should aim my sermon at the children. And I looked at him and I said, the kids aren't going to listen to me standing up front in a row talking to them um, when they don't normally sit through our sermons anyway. And I said, how about if I have them sit with me and I'll read them a story? And he said, well, you could try it. So. I did that for a couple of years and couldn't find a story that I felt I was called to read. And I sat back and I thought, all right, God, now what do I do? I can't find the, a book. And he says, well, you're writing it. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, I don't know how to do that. I have no clue. And he said, yes, you are, and I will help you. So I started typing and a really fun story actually came about and I called it that wonderful night. It's the nativity told through the eyes of the innkeeper's daughter. And so I printed it, put it on construction paper, added some pictures and had it spiral bound. And the kids sat the best through that one than they had any of the other ones. 
And it was just so much fun to watch their reactions as I read the, the story. And when everyone was leaving, several people asked what book I'd read. They said they wanted to pick it up. And I thought, well, hang on, I'll go print you one. I wrote it. And they encouraged me to get it um, published. And I said, okay, <laughs> and left it because I had no idea what was going on. And well, God still wasn't done. He connected me with a local author who connected me with her publisher. By the following September, I had my books, set up 58 book signings in November and December, and almost sold 2,000 books. And I think, okay, Lord, I guess you have something here. <laughs> so it, it's been a fun ride. We have since moved to Florida, and he connected me with Word Weavers, which is a Christian writing group. And they also have the Florida Christian Writers Conference, which is the end of February. And through them, I now have an agent and a publisher, and I have a total of seven books out now. And he's still working. He's got me on it, started on another series, and it's just to feel his presence in my life and how he guides me. And if I'm stay quiet and listen, he always heads me in the right direction. And I praise him for all the blessings in my life. Thank you. That is amazing. And I, I think that speaks to the whole idea of uh, counting on God and trusting God and, and, you know, taking even that you said that you were low on funds and you decided you'd still tithe and you counted on God and trusted God and it all worked out in the end. Beautiful story. Thank you. Uh, Julie, would you like to share your story? Yes, I'd be honored. I am honored. Anytime God opens a door uh, for me to speak my story, which is his. Most of my adult life, I chased happiness in a cycle of depression, alcohol abuse, and with emotionally unavailable men. Loneliness was my heart song from a young age. I did not know peace or hope. I knew survival and a perfectionism mask, and when I got weary, I would think of giving up. The God I didn't know at the time uh, connected me with a man who is still my husband who, <laughs> looking back, you know, I didn't trust him then, but that's who he gave me, a man that I could trust. However, I still didn't know God when we got married, and at age 35, we had both our boys, and the depression then turned to a bitterness. My heart was stone. I had lost both of my parents. We had moved away from my friends and my, his family at that point for his job. Um, I numbed my depression, my anger, my bitterness, most nights with wine after the kids went to bed. And from that point, from 35 to 40, I was an atheist and not because I wanted to argue theology. Uh, I didn't know theology. I certainly didn't know God or want to know him. Um, anybody who approached me and I can't, I wish I could remember, maybe God will bring that to me later in my life or in my writing, but uh, there was a friend our kids went to preschool together and there was one day she sat in my car. We were waiting for them to be done. And she said, Julie, maybe you should try going to church. And I said, why? I mean, there was nothing there for me. But God in his sovereignty, in his absolute relentless pursuit of us, um, at, at age 40, he sent a disciple who knocked on my door in my neighborhood, um, in, in my house, rather. I didn't have to go anywhere. She knocked on my door. Um, I didn't probably greet her very nicely that time, but she noticed I liked to walk in the neighborhood. So he sent me somebody in my loneliness who walked with me, who talked with me, um, I didn't know right away, but eventually I learned she was a pastor's wife. 
she gave me Rick Warren's A Purpose Driven Life to read and invited me to ask any questions I had. And I mean, that was in my world, the first person who ever showed any interest or attention in wanting me to know about a God that I didn't know. So that year, that year I was 40, we walked and talked and walked and talked. And that Christmas, I said to my husband, I don't know why, but I have to go to church tonight, Christmas Eve. I And he said, I'll stay with the boys. That wasn't in our family's wheelhouse at the time. And it was that night that I sat in a back pew. Uh, I didn't feel I belonged there, but I snuck in. I sat in the back pew and I saw everybody singing songs looking forward to the pastor and holding these candles. And I thought, well, God is real. All these people in this room believe he is real. And not to mention he, you know, got me there somehow uh, that night to sit in the pew. So from 40, uh, I didn't know anything but God the Father for the first three years. I, What I began to do almost immediately after I started going to church and learning about prayer, um, I started praying. I just, I was so grateful for somebody to listen to 40 years of what I, all the things <laughs> in my early spiritual walk. I didn't understand that he knew what was going on 40 years ago, but I wanted to tell him everything and he listened. Um, in September 2014, I went to my first women's retreat and I chose a meditative prayer session. At this time, I had not read much of the Bible. It scared me. It was big. It had many uh, Yeah, it didn't scare me like I was afraid of it, but I didn't, in my perfectionism, I didn't want to tackle it. I knew I wasn't going to learn it right away. And there I sat in this women's meditative prayer session. The woman uh, read Isaiah 41.10. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And during this time, my mind was blank. The truth I had never read or heard before was sinking in. And God spoke audibly three words. He said, no more alcohol. And when I opened my eyes in this prayer session, I was the last person to open my eyes. People had been talking amongst themselves, waiting for me to finish whatever God was doing with me and kind of freaked me out. I wanted to look around the room and <laughs> find where this voice was. But I knew, I mean, my soul knew before my brain knew that it was God talking to me. And although I didn't ask for any help, with alcohol, he knew that I had no business drinking it with my family's uh, genetics, with the patterns, with the strongholds. And so I obeyed him. I obeyed him first out of fear. I didn't want to find out what would happen to me if I didn't obey him. And then very, very quickly, out of respect and honor, for the Father God that uh, cared enough about me to tell me something probably other people, you know, should have told me a long time ago. So still Father God, Father God, Father God. And then I was in Sunday school one. So this is probably two and a half years ago. And I said, okay. How come some people pray to Jesus and I pray to God? I mean, what is the deal? I, I what am I what am I missing here? And that began 
uh, when I was, I was explained that day, the Trinity. And that began the love affair with Jesus that will never end. I will chase him until I don't have breath. Standing on the mountain, a mountaintop with him for um, quite a while. It seemed to last like a year and a half. I felt like my life was healed and straightened forever. I knew I would never be alone again. But last year, depression came back for me and I did not understand it. I thought it was all past. I thought I was done. You know, the the reasons I was depressed for a lot of my life seem to be filled now with God. And the difference in my life without God, there was no hope on the days that I didn't believe. I mean, all days I believed things wouldn't get better. So on the days that I didn't have the strength to push through is when I thought, you know, this is getting old. And with God, even even though it did get pretty dark last year, in my soul, he was there. I never, ever lost hope that, um, in fact, <laughs> the closeness with him was something I had not experienced a very, very gentle, not too bright, but always light next to me in the dark. And he put several people in my path because my stubbornness, my will was still trying to say I should not be depressed. Um, I think in the Christian faith, I don't think we honor, uh, as a whole, I don't think we honor mental health and addiction and things like that as apart from will a lot of times. And so for me, I was in that mindset going, I, I have God, I don't need. But he said, he gave me a friend who said, Julie, in the Bible, we are called to seek wise counsel. So yes, go, go to a counselor. And I did. And that counselor that he connected me with used my writing skills. Uh, didn't judge, didn't, you know, none of that to help me go to the place, the root of all of that loneliness for years. And then I had Jesus to do that with. So it was it was a time when I learned to say to God who at that point, I just have been not, nothing but thankful to say, Lord, what do you want me to learn? Because I trusted him that it wasn't, <laughs> this wasn't a bad thing happening to me. There was a reason that this was happening. And so with the counselor, with him, with prayer, with medication is what I finally, and it got worse and worse when I went to, um, to the doctor. And I believe that God knows that there's a place for medication. There are some of us who have, um, you know, brains that are wired that way. It's, it's interesting, you know, my brother and I are both first generation Christians and he grew up, <laughs> no depression. Um, he can stop after a drink or two. I never really could. I, I always wanted more. So I accept that limitation in myself. It, um, this fall will be four years with no alcohol, and I certainly won't sit here and boast and say I will never drink again because God told me not to, but boy, he's taken away the desire, the taste, the want, and I will never sit here and say I won't be depressed again because maybe it will come back, but the message he gave me in that depression 
is something in speaking that now has three dates on the book joy in a broken world so here we go people praise the lord and the joy that is sometimes loud and clanging and uh you know we sing loud and then sometimes it's just quiet it's quiet in our soul but never alone thank you so much Thank you. Wow. What an amazing testimony. And, and then also, I just wanted to know, let you know, I'm collecting notes on what you're all saying. And I'm also, uh, I've noted that you mentioned Isaiah 41.10. And I noted that Jan mentioned Proverbs 22.6. And those are a couple of verses. Well, hopefully, if everyone else mentions a verse, if you have one, uh, I'll collect those and, and we'll share those later. Um, so thank you so much. And, and again, I'm, I'm glad that it's been four years. It's extremely, you should be extremely proud of yourself for and, and uh, thankful, I am sure, I'm sure you are thankful. I can tell with your voice, it's, it's amazing. <laughs> Great story, thank you. Uh, Rachel, would you like to continue? Yes, thank you, yes, thank you. And I just wanna say too, it's so nice to hear Julie's testimony. I've been reading her poetry online and it's so full of joy and hope and to see how God redeems her broken past, which I hadn't heard before today, and to see the joy that she has now. And God really does a changing work in our lives. So my testimony is, is quite different than um, Julie's that we just heard, but I was saved when I was a young child. My parents actually met each other while they were pursuing their Masters of Divinity at Biblical Theological Seminary. So in our home, we had a very solid biblical base. We, we constantly went to church and Sunday school, and I heard the gospel message from a young age. And uh, my memory of coming to know the Lord as my savior happened when I was a young child. And actually I was just in my living room and I had been thinking about Jesus during the commercial break actually of a TV show. And I don't even know what TV show it was, but just to hear, I thought about it and I thought, oh, Jesus died on the cross for my sins and I've never accepted that. So just in my heart there as a child praying to the Lord and saying, yes, Lord, I'm a sinner and I need your salvation or else I will have eternity without you. So that's the moment at which I became a believer in Jesus Christ. So I continue to grow in my faith in the Lord, just again, through going to church and going through Sunday school. And one thing my parents encouraged me to do, and also Sunday school teachers, encouraged me to read the Bible on my own, even when I was very young. And I think that was very important to me. Um, my parents had given me like a little devotional book that was meant for kids. And that helped me transition from, um, this is just something I do because my parents bring me to church, to this is what I do, because I believe in Jesus Christ. And um, another big step in my walk with the Lord that kind of hammered that in my life is as a teenager, I worked at uh, Victory Valley Camp in Zionsville, Pennsylvania, and that um, I was a counselor and a counselor assistant and a coordinator for their program where you live in a tent all summer long and have different groups of kids come in during the week and you get to have activities with them and teach them the Bible. But when I went to Victory Valley as a teenager, now I was the one who was explaining the Bible to kids. I was the one that had to know the answers so that I could explain that to them. I couldn't rely on whatever teacher would be in the room because it was me. I had to be the one that explained it. So that was another step in making my faith kind of uh, personal to me that I had to know where I stood with Jesus so that I could share that with the kids. So, um, at camp is actually where I met my husband. I was actually 15 when I started to date him. We're still you know, together, obviously, today. Um, and he is a pastor. So um, at the moment, I'm a stay-at-home mom with my four kids. They are all school age now. Um, but I do a lot of stuff at church with ministry-wise and reaching out to the people there. Um, and then I also write, as was mentioned before. And I used to feel that my testimony was quite boring. I used to feel like you know, it's just a simple thing. Jesus saved me when I was young and here I am. But over the years, I've the Lord has impressed upon my heart that God did not only save me from my sinful past, which was very short as far as the number of years are concerned, but God has also saved me from a future of sin in this life. 
Because where would my life be if I had not accepted Christ as my savior? It could be any number of things. Sins I struggle with, pride, with anger, with selfishness, with greed. If Jesus, if I had not been saved young, those things would have been rampant in my life. And who knows what my life would look like now. So I'm now I'm thankful for my testimony. I'm thankful the Lord saved me young. I'm thankful that I have that story and um, that work in me. And then I also wanted to just share, um, just since this is a Christian apologetics themed, I just wanted to share a couple ways the Lord has um, um, just kind of worked in my life in ways that I share Christ with others. Um, the first thing I do is I still teach kids, both at Sunday school and church, and um, even my own kids in my own home, teaching them about scripture, teaching them about Jesus. And the reason I think teaching kids helps with knowing, it helps with Christian apologetics is because you have to learn how to explain things simply. Because sometimes I think we approach Christian apologetics where we have to know every detail. We have to know every single thing before we're allowed to open our mouth and share it. But that's not the case. We need to do simple answers. We need to do simple truths from God's word. And the Holy Spirit is faithful in using those in people's lives. So I encourage you that if you have opportunity to teach kids or if you're not really a teacher, be a helper in a, te in a kid's classroom at church so that you can hear the simple answers so that you can share them with others. So another way that um, the Lord has given me opportunity in my life to share my faith has been discipling one on one with friends. Uh, when I first moved here to this part of Pennsylvania, um, I was brand new and the Lord put me in this group of moms that wasn't a Christian group and had a whole bunch of people with from all faiths or no faith. And um, the Lord gave me opportunity in that group to share with others about Jesus Christ. And I didn't do anything overt. I didn't have a big campaign to try to save the world through this mom's club club. But he did give me opportunity as it came up in conversation to share that I believe the Bible. I believe in Jesus Christ. And several of the moms had said, can you tell me more about it? And so I said, sure, we'll just come on over and we'll to my house and we'll see what we can do. So um, just having the opportunity to go through scripture with um, people one on one, first of all, helped my own faith because you never know what you're going to be asked when you're sitting down one on one with someone explaining scripture. So I had to be ready to share my faith kind of at a moment's notice that way. And if I ever didn't know, I just said, I'm sorry, I don't know. I'm going to look into that. And um, just an encouragement for those into Christian apologetics that don't be afraid to say, I don't know, and get back to them later. They're not going to think less of you. The outcome will be they will see the Bible as the authority. If you take your time to dig into the Bible and share, here you go, here's how I used it, they'll know that you're not a know-it-all. You don't know everything. There's nothing special about you. It's God and his word that is telling the truth, and that gives you opportunity to tell them the truth once you give the answer from scripture. So um, another thing which was mentioned in my introduction is lately um, I started a blog called readthehardparts.com, and that has helped me in my faith um, to kind of dig into the parts of scripture that we don't hear about often. Because we know the verse that it says that all scripture is God breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, training and righteousness. And that means all scripture. And a lot of times I see that we stick to familiar scriptures and we're a little nervous about going to the ones we haven't seen before. But through God putting this on my heart, it's making me dig into the hard parts of scripture and studying them and seeing what can we learn about who God is and what he wants from us and what he has planned for us um, in those hard parts of scripture. It's been a real challenge and I'm hoping it's challenging other Christians as well to find simple truths in those complex parts of scripture. Um, and then one more reason or one more way the Lord has helped me grow in my faith as I share it with others is spending time with people of other faiths. My kid's school is across the street from a mosque. And the mosque has a little, um, like, uh, like a private school inside of it. And 
what would happen is after school let out, uh, a lot of the Islamic moms would come pick up their kids at the mosque school, and a lot of us would come pick up our kids um, at our kids' school, and then there's a playground in between. And a lot of times we would all, on nice days, we'd all spend time at the playground together. And when we were doing it, I made a point to speak to those moms from the mosque, because a lot of a lot of um, a lot of parents whose kids went to the public school weren't doing that. They're pretty much ignoring them. But instead, I chose to share Christ's love and to introduce myself to them. And I've met some really great ladies through that way. And I haven't always had faith conversations with them, but the opportunity was there for them to ask questions about my faith and for me to ask questions about their faith as well. Um, I, I have found that sometimes the issues I think or growing up in the church, the issues I think are important to know in order to reach out for unbelie to unbelievers are not really the same issues that unbelievers are actually interested in. So I find that sometimes like, at least I don't hear about it quite so much now, but at least when I was growing up in the church, creation and evolution was the big debate. And if people would just do that, maybe that would get them closer to Jesus Christ. But I don't find that in talking with unbelievers, that's a number one concern. They just want to know about them. Who, who am I? Who does God, what does God think of me? How am I going to get to eternity in heaven? And I think the things that in talk and getting to know people on an individual level and getting to know unbelievers personally, God is going to open the doors for you to share your faith, both in your own experience and the truth from God's word. So thank you. Thank you for letting me share my testimony. Thank you. That's an absolutely beautiful testimony. And I, I loved your advice on, on just getting to know people of different cultures and different groups. And I think that's so important for everybody because how are we supposed to, to, if we only surround ourselves with other Christians, how are we ever going to be able to pass the good news on? So I, I really like that Absolutely. Message. I recommend David Wood, by the way, if you've ever watched his videos as far as uh, Muslims, he, he's got a pretty interesting uh, line of YouTube videos. You might want to think about that. Um, great. And uh, let's go on to Heather. Yeah, hi. Um, so I will try to be short. Um, I gave a 20 minute testimony in Stephanie's coffee talk number six. Um, but like you, Rachel, I also became a Christian when I was very young. So trying to remember what it was like before I became a Christian, um, I, I really have to try to think, sit down and, and think about that. Um, there are some things that I do remember, though. Um, I before I became a believer, I, I do remember um, having an, an experience with death and heaven. Um, and so my mom's um, best friend had two boys at the time. Um, she went on to have uh, three more uh, kids. She had twin girls and then um, her youngest was a girl. But her second uh, son that was born, he, he actually was in, a, in an accident and uh, he was in a church parking lot. Um, apparently, it just wasn't supervised very well. And there were big things out in the parking lot. And I guess there was a piano sort of on a hill. And, and you know how kids are. They're very energetic and playing. And unfortunately, the piano uh, collapsed on this uh, little boy. And he, he actually died. Um, and I must have been maybe, I don't know, maybe five years old, four or five. Um, it, and it was just a horrible tragedy. Uh, and but, you know, I was very small. And that's when I learned about death and that, you know, we were going to die someday. And it, it just um, it was a time in my life when I learned about heaven and we have a soul and our soul goes on after heaven. I just I was taught all of these things at a very young age. Um, my family went to church. And so. You know, I, I, I guess the reality of life and death just became so real to me um, when I was when I was very young. Um, I hadn't learned about Jesus yet. Um, that would come later. I do remember having dreams, though. I know some people don't have dreams, but but I do. <laughs> and um, one time I had a dream, you know, about something that was very frightening. Uh, it was, you know, an enemy who was chained up and he was trying to get out. And, um, I wondered what that was all about. I had another dream about, uh, heaven and, you know, I, it just became real that there really is, uh, 
you know, a place called heaven. So I guess the concept of eternity uh, came into my life very, you know, when I was very young and I, I wanted to know what was going to happen to my soul after I died. You know, I, I knew this other little boy died and I wondered what happened to him. And so these things just made a big impression on me. Um, something else that really stood out is I saw a performance at church uh, and it was a lady who stood up and she gave a performance of Eve in the Garden of Eden and she would turn one way and she would actually play the part of Eve and then she literally did a 180 degree turn and turn the other way and then she played the part of the serpent and um, just the way that she did it was brilliant. I mean, it was just absolutely amazing. And I was just a little kid at the time. It made this huge impression. Um, you know, I became aware of spiritual warfare and, you know, I, I just, I knew I wanted more good and I did not want evil in my life. And so that, you know, that also made a big impression on me. Um, but of course, you know, this idea of Jesus came up and, at the time when I was little, I, I wondered why does everybody make a fuss at church about Jesus? And so I, I didn't really understand it. You know, my, my mom's friend had a little boy and he died and everybody's not talking about him at church, you know? So what is it about Jesus that died that makes him so spectacular? And I didn't know it at the time. I mean, I hadn't learned about the historical Jesus um, but I do remember wondering, what is the big deal? What is the big deal about Jesus? Um, and so, you know, uh, I went to an evangelical church and then, you know, I began to learn that God raised Jesus from the dead. And then I began to learn about the character of Jesus. And I began to learn, you know, that he's the son of God. And then he died on the cross to pay the penalty for my sins. And then I started to learn why he is amazing and wonderful and good and unique. And, you know, I started to learn these things. Um, and then I just, I realized for me, I guess I just, I realized that I needed, I needed Jesus. I realized I needed, I need a savior. You know, I want to make sure that I want to have the assurance of salvation. I want to make sure that I, you know, um, go to heaven. And so I received Christ, um, you know, as my Lord and Savior when I, when I was very young. Um, so I just, I love giving testimonies, uh, you know, salvation testimonies. There's different kinds of testimonies. Jan, I loved your testimony that you trusted in God and that, you know, you became, became more aware of how he gu can guide you and that he will help you. And that is, that's a beautiful testimony. I, I love that, Jan. Um, I love that very much. Um, Julie, you had mentioned that you had a friend who invited you, you know, to go to church and she reached out to you, you know, you went to church, even though you felt like you didn't belong, you were there. I love this friend of yours, whoever she is. I love her for reaching out to you, you know, and um, it's just a really good example. You know, it makes me want to reach out to people more. And, um, Stephanie, you have been a great example of, of reaching out to so many people, you know, on Twitter and I'm sure, you know, there, uh, at your workplace and in your neighborhood, you've been a great, great example of reaching out, you know, to people and love people from other religions and, you know, or even atheists. Um, Rachel, you brought that up too, you know, that you reached out to other people and you reached out you know, to some Muslim uh, mothers at the playground. That's so awesome. I'm so glad that, um, you know, that you're doing that. That That's just, it's, it's really awesome. But uh, thank you all for being here. I'll just say that real quick. Um, uh, it's great to see you all. I know I, you know, we met on Twitter and um, I'm trying to do a better job just reaching out and loving people and making good connections. Um, but I, I do appreciate you being here today. And thanks again, Stephanie, for having me.
Oh, thank you for everything, Heather. I mean, you're the one who puts these together. <laughs> I think I really got a, a person running my channel with me. So we're, we're together in this. You found these wonderful people. So I'm, I'm thrilled that, that you brought everybody in. And, and I agree with you. There is a spiritual warfare. And, and, and that's actually something that we see every single day when we really attune ourselves to that. Um, so that's, that's those are, again, more wonderful points from you. Um, Anne, would you like to share your testimony? I sure will. Hello, all. Uh, my name is Ann Kincaid from Ohio, and I'm a praise harpist and the owner of Praise Recordings LLC. And I'm here with Christian Coffee Top today, top, talk today to give my testimony if I can talk right. And first off, I just want to say I'm very honored to be asked, and thank you all. And I've been very inspired by the testimony so far from Jan and Julie and Rachel and Heather. It's really lifted my heart. I just love listening to it. I could listen to it all day. Um, when I was asked, to give a testimony, I, you know, I started wondering as a Christian apologetics um, channel, and I wondered, how do I really explain to a non-Christian who might be listening today what it means to be saved, uh, to someone who possibly has no concept of a relationship with God or redemption through Christ? So I thought, if I, if I could name my testimony, I think I want to call it amnesia. And I know that sounds a little strange. But let me explain. Uh, being lost or being saved, you know, what is it really? What does it mean? I was saved when I was five or six years old uh, because I understood there was a God and I didn't want to go to hell. <laughs> so I was raised in a Christian family and went to church every week. But I want to tell you that coming to God and knowing more about who God is are two entirely different things. And I think I can compare, compare being spiritually lost to having amnesia. Now, when you've lost your physical memory, you can't remember who you are, who you were, where you came from, who your family are, um, or what you even had for lunch yesterday. So your memory is damaged. It's broken. It's lost. Um, it's terrifying. And this is, I think, the same thing that happened to all of us when we became spiritually lost, um, like was mentioned in the Garden of Eden. So, and being saved, well, that's, to me, is like the wonderful feeling of getting your lost memory back and having it work right again. Uh, remembering what you had for lunch yesterday. Remembering your friends and who your family are. Now, I've heard some people say, that when they were saved, everything in their life became clear. And they began to know who God the Father is and who the Lord Jesus Christ is. And through God's spirit, they began to know, almost like remembering who they are in Christ. And it was the same for me. I realized I was a child of God and that I belonged to his family. And, you know, salvation is a shocking revelation if you've just been thinking of yourself um, at times, possibly nothing more than maybe a speck of dust, or as some people say, just an animal running around the planet without any kind of purpose or real love or even accountability of, for your actions. Now, I realized when I was older that there was nothing I had or could ever do well enough or could bring to God to save myself. And when you're standing in the presence of an all-powerful, totally holy God of the universe, you are nothing. <laughs> and it's really, truly amazing to find out that all we have to do through faith and belief is ask for forgiveness and accept God's pardon for sin through Christ's death on the cross. You know, what happens next is that we begin to understand, almost like remembering who we really are. And we come back home to God spiritually. And it's a joy too, uh, I think, to find out that God who calls himself our heavenly father truly loves us. And, you know, he's been waiting and wanting us to remember him. Uh, a greater knowledge of God does come through uh, his word or reading the Bible. And when spiritual memory comes back, uh, I'm using that analogy, what you're reading begins um, to make sense, you get it, the verses stand out. For example, when God talks about loving him first and then your neighbor second, it begins to move your heart, it changes your life. Uh, there's also something that I think is very interesting. The Bible says that in heaven, someday we're gonna know 
as we're known. And that to me seems like some type of instant awareness of each other. And I think when we get saved and our spiritual amnesia goes away, we also get a little taste of that awareness here on earth, especially um, when we seem to instantly connect with other Christians like I'm doing today, really. Um, not to say that all Christian family members get along all the time, but sometimes they don't. They get off path. Um, we all know that's true. <laughs> and actually, um, that reminds me of when Christ washed the dust and the mud off the feet of his disciples at the Passover meal uh, before he died, which was Easter. And that's going to be coming up here soon. And, you know, then he said they were clean. And when we get saved, we are too. But just like those disciples, you know, I have to say, I've had times in my life when I've walked through the mud. And I admit that sometimes playing in the mud or sin can be fun when you're young, <laughs> but it's messy. <laughs> and of course, everyone else older in the Lord, uh, they're going to notice that. <laughs> but um, then as I matured too, I found out that I also wanted to keep my spiritual clothes cleaner. And none of us want to have dusty feet or muddy clothes when the Lord comes back. So that's why to somebody listening today, I want to try to explain who might know the, not who might not know the Lord, that sometimes you will see Christians avoiding certain circumstances and it should never be because they are judging someone's heart. Um, it's just that they're trying to stay out of the mud of sin. Because mud can not only be messy, it can be dangerous or contaminated or make you sick if you eat it like kids do <laughs> or worse. Um, and as a Christian, I think that the best way to keep our spiritual lives cleaner is just to keep walking forward in the Lord. Um, but that never, ever means that we should walk by those who are hurting around us or not help when somebody has fallen down. We should stop and we must. And help wash their feet and lift them up. Uh, we need to meet their needs in the Lord's name, just like he did for us. Um, I do want to say, um, getting into a more personal testimony, that being a Christian has not made me immune from suffering real loss and hardship in this world. Uh, personally, I had a long career in a cubicle with a master's degree and lots of friends. And some of those friends even liked me. And um, then I was laid off and I lost my house and nearly everything I had. And I really tried to keep a good attitude because I was supposed to be a Christian. <laughs> but towards the um, end of that foreclosure period and bankruptcy and that hardship, I completely lost my courage and my ability to smile. It, it, it all just got too hard. And I still loved the Lord and believed in him, but I just, I just didn't have the strength to look up anymore. So I prayed at that time for help, for a distraction, or something from the Lord that would help me get through that period. And you know what? A really funny thing came to mind. I remembered listening to an orchestra from years ago when I was young. And in that orchestra, there was a golden-haired lady playing a big golden harp. And at that moment, during that foreclosure period, that golden harp memory somehow seemed about as close to heaven to me as you could get. <laughs> so I prayed simply that if the Lord would give me a little inexpensive, because I had no money at that time, harp to play around on, if he would just do that, I would praise him with it. So about two weeks later, I kind of felt the Lord tugging on my heart that I should check online for a harp for sale. So I did, and I found one. And it turned out to be a small harp with 26 strings, and it had a seven inch crack in the soundboard. And I found out that it had been abandoned in a storage locker in Springdale, Ohio. Now, someday I really hope to find out who gave it up so I can tell them it didn't go to waste. And the label inside read that it had been built by a Christian Mennonite carpenter from Coshocton, Ohio. And this carpenter made furniture and praise harps. So I decided to have him check it out because I had heard if harps are cracked, they can explode because they have a lot of tension. So I was a little worried about that. So 
when I visited the carpenter to check out the condition of the harp, I was told it was 11 years old and the crack was just on the surface and minor and to not worry about it. And actually it's produced three albums. And then the carpenter's daughter, Darlene, asked me if I wanted to know the dedication verse that had been prayed over it when it was made. And of course, you know, I said yes. And she said, Psalms 9-1, I will praise thee, O Lord, with my whole heart. I will show forth all thy marvelous works. And I was completely blown away. I had asked for a little heart just to praise the Lord with as a distraction. And what he did was he gave me one that was made by a Christian carpenter who only made praise harps with a prayer of praise dedication over it about praising the Lord. So that's why I'm a praise harpist today. <laughs> I don't, I think he completely controlled that whole process. Now, um, I will admit that I had about six months of piano classes in college, uh, which was a Bible college, which I dropped out of the classes, not the college. And I had three months of flute in the seventh grade that I also dropped out of because I had terrible stage fright and I was too afraid to do the recital. But then there was, when I received this harp, there was something very different about this instrument. And two months later, I found out by God's amazing grace that I could play almost anything I wanted by ear. And after nine months, I was asked to play at a cancer awareness benefit for the mayor. And at 11 months, I recorded my first album. And now um, we're working on a fourth collaboration album dedicated to loss and recovery for wounded hearts. And since then, I've played in various states for some mind-boggling, extraordinary events like for an exhibit in Naples, Florida, where the oldest biblical scrolls in the entire world were on display. And I've also played for um, those breathing their very last breath on their way to heaven, uh, like my dad, who I lost recently. And recently, um, I started a Christian talent production company uh, called Praise Recordings LLC, because first of all, I want to praise the Lord. He's just been so kind. And second, I want to help others heal from what I call their spiritual amnesia. You know, they've forgotten who they are, and I want to help them find that again. And third, I'm working to collaborate with other Christians um, to spotlight the, spotlight the amazing gifts that they've been given, because I'm certainly not the only one. And today is a very good example of that. There's lots of talent everywhere. So to close, I want to say that uh, the Lord died and he saved me from my sin and he's restored my joy. He gave me a little harp to praise him with and the ability to play it. Um, now, we all know that we have no idea what extraordinary things the Lord is waiting for us tomorrow, if, we, if he allows tomorrow. And I hope to just keep walking forward until he comes back. So the only memory loss that I think we should ever really want, truthfully, is when we forget the sad things that are behind and move forward in the joy of the Lord. You know, um, God seems to have experienced some remarkable memory loss also because when Jesus Christ died on the cross, he threw away my sins and he forgot them. So I guess uh, some forms of amnesia are a heavenly family trait. You know, as a child of God, I guess I picked that up from the Father and that's why we should forgive others. Um, oh, and one last thing before I forget, I want to wish everyone a happy Valentine's week. And if you're alone, I want to introduce you to the most amazing heart in the universe, Jesus Christ, who loves you with an absolutely everlasting love. And God bless. Thanks for the chance to give my testimony today. Thank you, Anne. That's absolutely beautiful and inspiring. Just amazing to hear a story with a harp and how you, you weren't, uh, you, you didn't really develop your skills in other instruments, but the harp just came naturally. That's really, truly amazing. Um, so let's go to Dell. Last but not least, Dell, would you like to share your story? I wonder if Dell still might be away right yet. Okay, so Dell is, maybe we'll wait a couple minutes for him to come back. Uh, would anyone like to, to um, mention anything else or ask questions of each other or anything like that. We've got a nice group of people in our live chat in case you're wondering. 
uh, we have Sonia and Callie and, uh, and uh, Jordan, who's actually, um, oh, why am I forgetting her name all of a sudden? I'm, I'm so silly. Uh, can you hear me? And, oh, now I can, Dell. Thank you. Can you hear me? I can, Dell. We well, I've had you. some technical issues. Uh, for some reason, my computer wouldn't accept the plug-in. And then I get on my phone, and my phone doesn't like my face because I can't get the video and the voice to go, to, to go together. So I just did the horrible little boring little picture. And then when I push off mute, um, my headset won't work. So I apologize. So I'm going to have to talk to you freestyle. I apologize. Um, thank you for having me. And Heather, thank you for asking me to be a part of this awesome, cool uh, experience. Um, uh, I, I didn't realize I was the only guy in the gig. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, but that's okay. I'm, I feel like I'm outnumbered, but the, but the testimony version, uh, that's way cool. Um, no, we're glad you're here. Just want to say that. We're glad you're here, Adele. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, we are. You're, Thank the, you. The voice is a little, a little low, but I'll try to speak. Uh, you guys can hear me okay. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Yes. Well, um, gosh, you ladies, uh, your, your testimonies were just out of this world. Um, I'm afraid if I add a little bit to this, I might take away from any, anything that was brought up, but um, I'll, I'll, I'll surely give it to my best. Um, just to wrap up real quickly, I, I know we, we don't have much time. Um, Jan, uh, you know, this, the great thing about our testimonies is, is that it gives people who are listening, who may be going through the same thing that we're going through that we did go through, it gives them an encouraging hope that I can get through this because I just listened to somebody's testimony and they encourage me that I can get through this. And, Amen. Uh, um, you know, Jan, your testimony was all about trustworthiness. Julie, your, yours, yours was about faithfulness. Rachel, uh, yours was about honesty. And I really appreciate your, your adding about the, the honesty and saying, you know what, it's okay if you don't know everything. I've learned that if when I get to a point where I know everything, I don't know nothing. So uh, let the Lord, let the word of God be our authority. So it takes the burden off us and lets the Lord have the burden because he said his burden is, is light. And um, Heather, yours was about obedience and uh, uh, that was awesome. And, and yours was about remembrance. And, uh, and girl, you just keep on harping for Jesus, okay? <laughs> I'll do that. Well, um, you know, <laughs> One of the great things about our testimonies is that it shows the world that, you know, there's not just many ways to heaven. Because like Heather said appropriately, we all need Jesus. You know, um, John 14, 6 says, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and life. No man come to the Father but through me. And our testimonies, when we share them, is a great way to show people that even though our testimonies may be vastly different, we all are led to the same place. Um, and... Um, that's Jesus, Jesus Christ. And, uh, um, and the fact that, you know, there are many ways to somebody's house, but there's ultimately one way to the front door, and that's the driveway. And Jesus is that driveway for us as Christians. Um, my testimony is basically um, humility. Um, uh, now, like Heather, you can, you can view her or listen to her, um, her, her testimony uh, through a podcast she mentioned. You can also hear my testimony in length at Steve Garofalo's podcast on Reasons for Truth. Um, it's from, it's entitled Prison to Preacher. And uh, you're like, what? <laughs> and I'll elaborate <laughs> on that. Um, but you can reach uh, Steve Garofalo. He has my podcast testimony. If you, uh, if those of you who are interested in hearing the lengthy version, but since we're kind of running out of time, are we there? Yeah, we're here. Okay, great. <clears throat> um, Basically, um, have any of y'all heard, um, seen the movie The Matrix? No, I have not seen it. Wow. You're that young, huh? <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> well, those of you who've seen The Matrix, I have a 10 second or less, te uh, uh, a 10 second or less testimony. And those of you who've seen The Matrix, uh, I, I took the red pill. <laughs> and those of you who don't know what that means, is the red pill is he, he took the red pill to know the truth. And the blue pill is just to wake up whatever you want to believe. But anyway, I, it's, it wasn't that easy. I wish it was. But um, uh, real briefly, uh, Heather, you asked me to, to bring up a couple things uh, real quickly uh, yes. apart from my testimony. Um, one of the things I think um, for me uh, that led me to the Lord um, ultimately and just grabbed onto it um, 
was the, the hole that I um, was dealing with as far as the existence of God, because I did come from a dysfunctional family. My mom gave her life to the Lord in, in later in life, but uh, before she did, I had to go through a lot of bumps and bruises and nine marriages my mom went through, um, an alcoholic wow. father. Uh, so I, I struggled. Uh, you know, people don't realize is that your physical father uh, really gives you uh, um, a, a reality of what the Heavenly Father is. And if your father, your real father on earth misrepresents that, you can ultimately get a misconception of the real father in heaven. That's right. And um, But for me, you know, the, the strongest argument for me looking back now as a believer uh, was the not not the cosmological argument, the moral argument, but actually mm-hmm. the theological argument. Really, that this really? Earth is finely tuned. That you have to have an answer for why there's something rather than nothing, because mm-hmm. we all know we all know that something uh, doesn't come out of nothing, uh, and yep. nothing comes. And and we know that something. Or actually, let me, let me, let me back up. Uh, nothing comes out of something. It's always something comes out of nothing. Ex nihilio. Um, mm-hmm. And that's our Lord God. Uh, and so um, when I became, when I, actually, when I was nine years old, I started drinking. And uh, my mom had a bottle of vodka in the bottom storage, where it was the worst place you could have alcohol for a kid. Um, I thought it was water. <laughs> <laughs> so Dale, I that's drinking. very young of you, nine years old. <laughs> <clears throat> yes, <laughs> but I was nine years old. Okay. And I started drinking, and I got hooked. And you know, says that's what Satan does. He gets you hooked, and he gets you a great idea. Hey, try this, and then you start doing it, and then he makes you feel bad for doing it in the first place. <laughs> yeah. And then you start doing it, and you get hooked, and then one thing leads to another, and then I start getting in trouble in school. And I had a juvenile record before I was a juvenile. And uh, um, when I went up to school, I went to school at a Christian liberal arts college. Um, and I'm skipping. I apologize. Like I said, you can go to Steve Garofalo's podcast and hear the entirety of it. But um, just to give you the little highlights of it, um, uh-huh. you know, when, when I went to college, um, I went to a Christian liberal arts college to play football. And I didn't really care about the Christian liberal arts. I just cared about because I didn't want to go to one a college and, and be third string. I wanted to go to a place where I could actually play. And um, so I went to this Christian liberal arts college in Iowa and um, I got in the wrong crowd and uh, yeah, people real don't realize this just because it has Christian slapped on it doesn't mean they're Christian. <laughs> yeah. Doesn't mean, you know, it's the, you know, uh, you know, remove your sandals. You're, you're walking on holy ground. And uh, I got in the wrong crowd and uh, um, one thing led to another, and a friend of mine were out drinking one night, and um, we um, we broke into a, an audio visual store, um, you know, and uh, just just because we were curious, because we saw it was the door was ajar, and uh, we went in there, and you know, being drunk out of our minds, we thought, oh, that's just so cool, and went inside there and just started towing stuff to our car, and uh, didn't have a clue what we were doing. And uh, brought the stuff back to my dorm room, woke up the next morning, sober minded. Now I'm like, what in the world did I just do? <laughs> and uh, um, evidently it was a big deal because it was in the paper and it made it on the news, the regional news. And uh, um, I kept the stuff in my dorm room for several months. And um, it wasn't until I just uh, started becoming paranoid, looking on my shoulder. That's what happens when you're under the law. People really don't realize this. When you're under the law, the law is constantly pursuing you, and you're never at rest. Um, um, Isaiah says that the, the wicked have no peace. Um, that's why there's no rest, and that's why we need Jesus as the Lord of the Sabbath, because when you're not in his rest, you're always unrested. So I was at unrest constantly, until finally I just said, you know what? Heck with this. I, I called my RD and said, I think I did something really stupid. I need you to come up to my dorm room and check out some things that I have. <laughs> <laughs> and he came out the dorm room and uh, saw everything, and his his eyes popped open uh, wide, and and he just looked at me. He says, "Dell, you know, I'm, I'm gonna have to call the police." And I said, "Yeah, I, I know, I understand." So they called the police, and they brought him up there, and I had to give a report. Went down to the station, and um, filled out a report, and um, I was kicked out of college. I was kicked off the team, and um, I had to come back for a court date. I had an attorney. 
who actually, it's kind of interesting how the Lord orchestrated all this. I had an attorney. He was my business law professor. <laughs> so I, I didn't know who to contact. I didn't know who could help me out. So I contacted him and he was willing to, uh, <clears throat> to represent me. And uh, so he represented me. And uh, when we got in there, I knew right away the judge was going to just use me and my friend as a, as a, a platform to, for other people who, you know, do do this kind of thing. And uh, I knew he's going to throw the book at me. I, I was going to be a felon. I was going to go to prison for five to 10 years. And my lawyer, Steve Powell's, he uh, told the judge, he said, listen, he said, I can promise you and assure you that these men will never be back in your courtroom again. I can personally vouch for you that he, they, these two will not be back again. And uh, the judge says, well, you know, you know that you're, you're, you're giving your word and this, and if, if I do this um, and they do come back, this will be on you. This will be on your reputation. And Steve says, I understand that. And um, they knocked down the sentence from a, a felon to a serious misdemeanor. And uh, I had to serve two months in the, the Iowa Department of Corrections. Uh, I had to do uh, retribution. Um, um, I had to, you know, take counseling and um, Alcoholic Anonymous, the, you know, the whole nine yards. And, um, well, I left and I was never going to come back to Iowa because I'm like, okay, I'm totally just embarrassed, shamed, sh shunned. And, and I realized the Lord told me, he says, you know, you started something, Dell. You need to finish it. You need to go back and finish your degree. I'm like, oh my gosh, are you kidding me? And so the next year I, I sent a letter and asked him to send me back to school. And I said, listen, I, you know, uh, I'll be good. I won't, we have any more trouble out of me. And they agreed to let me back into school. And I was actually able to go back on the team again. And, um, but it didn't change, you know, when I got back to school, um, because, when I got back to school, I had to serve, like I said, two months in, in jail, and I and I entered my in the jail for two months. And uh, while I was there, the first week I was there, uh, they have guys that come in there with their Bibles, you know. I, I I think they were Gideons, but I'm not sure. But they were in there while I was serving my two months. My first week I was there, and um, I was angry, upset at how everything happened. And um, he came and approached me and gave me a Bible. And I looked at it and I threw it back at him. <laughs> and he's like, and this, and, and I got to stop here because this is very important. How you deal with people can really greatly affect the outcome of whether you bring somebody closer to the Lord or further away from them and how you act. That's right. Uh, and um, so he just dealt, dealt down and picked up the Bible, brushed it off. And I can tell in the look of his eyes that he was holding something very important to him. And he says, Dell, you know what? <clears throat> Do you want to be set free? I said, okay, what are you talking about? I'm, I'm only, I've only been here a week and a half, and you're telling me about setting free. I'm not going to get out of here for another month and a half. And he says, no, 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 no. You, you don't understand. Do you want to be set free on the inside? So you're not free on the outside yet, but you need to be free on the inside. And I'm like, well, yeah, duh. Yeah, of course. I want to be free, of course. And he turned to 2 Corinthians 5.17. And he read, and I'll never forget, he read it to me. He says, Dell, anyone who is in Christ, they're a new creation. All things have, behold, the old has passed away. Behold, all things have been made new. He says, Dell, he says, there's so many people out here on the outside that don't know Jesus. They're locked up tighter than you are on, on the inside. But through Jesus Christ, Dell, you can have freedom today, even though you're so locked up and you won't get out of this, these bars for another month and a half. You can still be free. And Jesus said, you can be free and you can be free indeed. And I, I listened to him. He, he shared the gospel with me. Um, he said he wanted to pray with me. And I, you know, I, I let him pray with me. I didn't give my life to the Lord that day. But what's important is because of the way he handled me, he planted a seed. Right. And I took that seed when I got out. And I took it with me and um, it just, it nagged at me because uh, when I was there, I got out, um, the stipulation of me going back to school there, I had to be next to the resident director and I couldn't have a roommate. I was on, they called it severe probation. I didn't know probation could be so severe, but I guess evidently they're, they have a severe probation there at that school. And, you know, if I missed chapel one time, I had to go three times a week. If I missed one chapel, I'm out. You know, if I did anything 
of any kind of that that of any kind against the the college of any kind whatsoever, I'd be kicked out. And so, after a couple few weeks, I'm like, man, I feel like I'm still in prison. I still jail. And so I had a friend of mine who was, uh, uh, he lived off campus he had an apartment and I'll never forget him. He was just a great guy, Jason Trui, I think his name is. And he, he let me live with him. And, and, uh, uh it wasn't a few, few days afterwards where I just, I woke up one day so heavy, heavy burden. I just, I was just so burdened with everything. And I finally did. I think the Lord just got me to a point where I'm just like, okay, I can't do this anymore on my own. I've tried to do everything I can on my own and this is not working. I just had no peace. So I went to school, got through with school, came back home, the apartment, and I just knelt down and uh, I said, well, let, let me just, let me put on some music. And my friend, uh, Jason, he listened to Christian music and he was listening to Caleb. And uh, the song came on called I Want to Change by Russ Taft. I, it was 10 years old already by the time I heard it. But one of the lyrics said, I, you know, I don't want to be trapped in the patterns of life that's set for me. And that's the exact same prayer, the thing I was thinking to myself when I was in jail, because I was really thinking, okay, where do I go from here? But I do know that I don't want to be trapped in the patterns that life has set for me. I don't want to be like my father or his grand or his father. They were all alcoholics. I don't want to be like this. I don't want to go down this path. And I heard that song, and it just I immediately knelt down and I started bawling. And uh, I didn't know what the words to say. All I knew was that, Lord, I have sinned against your kingdom. Um, I have sinned against you. Uh, I misrepresented you. Uh, I've, I've been a sinner. And I, and I ask you now, Lord, please forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart. Change me. And... Um, Man, I didn't think this was going to be this hard. <laughs> um, give my testimony a lot of times, but um, anyway, um, it was like a strainer, you know, like wet pasta and a, and a strainer. And the Lord just straining the sinful past of my life out of me. And it wasn't one of those, you know, go tell on the mountain moments. It wasn't one of those, oh, ooey gooey, fuzzy feeling moments. It was the realization, finally, that Del Potter, you've just been forgiven of your sins. Now go and sin no more. And I opened my eyes, and like the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts, who, when he finally understood Scripture, he says, "I want to be baptized. I want to be baptized immediately, not to, not 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 tomorrow, not in the next hour, but now." And uh, contacted a friend of mine who was uh, who was at a Christian Missionary Alliance, and I said, "Listen, I don't know what church you go to, but I know this one because I know you. I want to be baptized. I ask the Lord to forgive me. I ask Him my heart." And I know right now I just want to baptize, be baptized, not because the water does anything for me. It's wetness to the witness. It's just I want to show people through this example of being dead and sin and alive in Christ. I want to show people that the Lord has truly forgiven me, and I want to be obedient to him. I want to be trustworthy to him. I want to be remembrance of him. And I want to show you people that the Lord does forgive the most wretched people and he can do miraculous things through our natural bodies. And uh, um, I gave my life to the Lord. I haven't looked back since. Obviously, like some of you ladies were talking about earlier, you know, we stumble, we fall. But the great thing about the believer, the heartfelt believer, is that we do stumble, we fall, but we get back and we press on to fight the good fight, to gain the prize like Paul talked about in Timothy. And we don't look back, and we just keep looking forward. And so those people who are listening right now, you know, Wherever you are, wherever you're at, Jesus Christ could save you. That's you just right. got to trust him and know that he has your best interest in mind. And, uh, you know, religion, listen, religion, God, religion doesn't expose the problem with God. Religion exposes the problem with man's interpretation of God. So let loose of that. Take hold of that which is fleeting. And like what the Lord had said, you know, he says, you know, it's the people that have the the the, the new wine skin with the new wine that can hold my word. So shut off, become a new creation, put on new wine skin, and allow the Lord to fill you with his wine. Allow him to fill your heart with eternity, like he talks about in Ecclesiastes 3.11. Allow him to fill the void that alcohol can never fill. Let him fill the void that narcotics can never give. Let him fill the void that no matter how many people you, you go around and, and you date or sleep with, let the Lord Jesus Christ be the filler in the void of your life. 
And so I thank you so much for your time. And thank you so much for allowing me to share my testimony. And, and, and God bless you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dell. And, and you speak a lot. You're, I love how you summarized everyone else's testimony. Really spot on with that. And the people in the live chat loved how you did that too. And, uh, and I think that's amazing. And I also like that yours is kind of about submission. I, I think that I see a little bit of submission and, and, and just obeying. And what's, what's also amazing is this morning when I was riding my bike, I was thinking about lighthouses because <laughs> I was thinking that we want to be a light to others and we want to shine a light like a lighthouse. And it's kind of funny that that's your uh, picture that you have there is of a lighthouse. Um, I want to say something that I think you guys might like. I, uh, I flipped open the Bible a couple of weeks ago, twice, a few times over the week, I, I prayed and I flipped it open asking for a message from God. And uh, one of the times was right before I was going to go into one of these talks with a couple of atheists. And I really wanted to get out of it. <laughs> I, I really did not want to do it um, because I, I woke up. I wasn't feeling very well. I think I had a cold. It was just miserable. And I, I flipped open the Bible. I said, please, God, just tell me, can I, can I just get out of this? I, I really don't want to do it. And so I come upon uh, this verse, 1 Thessalonians 3.9. And it says, how can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy we have in the presence of our Lord because of you? And I, I thought to myself, I pictured those two women I was going to chat with. And, and I thought, you know, I'm going to go into this and, and just be as kind as possible. And I've learned in my own testimony that, uh, I, uh, you know, you fall, <laughs> you make mistakes. Um, last summer, I, I made a lot of mistakes with atheists. I was online making my little jokes, thinking I was very funny um, at their expense. And, uh, and I learned um, a lot, I lost a lot of them and I, I said a couple of things I regret. So I um, went to the, one, a couple of the atheists told me on Friday night this week, they said, two of them came to me and they said, you really need to um, get in your blog and write something about how you're gonna apologize formally to them. And I thought, oh, I just don't wanna do that. I'm gonna have to dig really deeply on a formal apology here. And, uh, and, and because I have, they've kind of beat me up sometimes too. It's, it's sort of been a two way uh, relationship. Um, but, but I thought, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to listen. And I listened to the pastor of my church uh, yesterday morning. And he said, um, he used this verse, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. And it's from a, a first, what is that? Oh, I'm forgetting which verse that is, but it's, it's right out of the Bible. And, uh, and I wrote a blog based on that. And it, it the idea is, we have to remember, just like all of you have mentioned, we're, we have to set an example and no one's going to come uh, find Jesus if they look at us and they say, oh, is that what it's like to be a Christian? And, and <laughs> <laughs> so we have to we have to sometimes be humble or and submit uh -huh. and, 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 and forgive and, and forget, yeah. move on. We have to imitate him. And it's so hard sometimes. But but I think that's one of the messages that I just like to share. That's awesome. uh, would, would, any of you, would any of you like to say anything more or, or uh, build off of our previous conversation or anyone have questions for each other? I'm, I'm just overwhelmed by the amazing testimonies of these ladies and Dell. It, it's, it's been an extraordinary day. I, I'm just so mm -hmm. grateful that you asked me to participate, but I'm, I think I'm getting more out of it than anyone else. So <laughs> I'm really enjoying nice. it. <laughs> No, I am too. I learn a lot. And I, we have a great group of people in the, in the chat who've been listening. Actually, I think they might all be Christians. I, usually, I, I told you I attract some atheists sometimes, but today it looks like uh, at least they're not posting anything in the chat. So, um, but hopefully it, it strengthens each of our uh, faith in, in God by doing what we're doing and, and moving forward and, and trying to be an example. It's, it's hard. We fall. <laughs> and, and sometimes I have this humor that, that comes out that doesn't come out in the nicest way. So, uh, so I don't want that to happen. <laughs> so would anyone else like to say anything? Just thank you for the opportunity. It's been fun. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, I guess I'll just go ahead and close. I'll just say thank you, everyone, for coming on. And uh, I really appreciate listening to everyone's stories today. I'm going to go ahead and, and close the chat. Would you all like to say thank you or goodbye or thank you to our listeners for paying attention? <laughs> thank, <laughs> thank you so you. much, everybody. God bless. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Stephanie.